Shana Tova, Happy New Year. I am Halise Lieberman, and it is my pleasure, as director of the Toby Center for Jewish Life and Learning, to welcome you to a special edition of TJHT Talks in partnership with the Michael Trayson Fund for Poland. Our program will last approximately 75 minutes. The hour-long conversation will be followed by 50 minutes for Q&A, and if you'd like to let us know where you are at the moment, share greetings with some of our guests, or submit a question, please do so in the comment section. And today I have the honor of hosting and serving as a panelist. And as with many Jewish conversations, we will start with a few questions. Who were the Polish Jews who, after the war, and having seen off a majority of their compatriots who had emigrated to the West or to the newly established state of Israel, built new lives in the People's Republic of Poland. Which path did they choose or which path was chosen for them? To hide or disregard their Jewish roots? To engage ardently in building a communist Poland? To reconstruct Jewish institutions, schools, summer camps and cultural life, to be forced to emigrate at a later date, to be forced to start a Jewish flying university, to put Jewish education as a priority in 1988, even before the Berlin Wall was taken down, or to find out four decades later, after being taken in as children by Polish Gentiles during the war, that they too had Jewish family roots. It's my pleasure to welcome our moderator, Michael Trayson, who inspired this conversation and the participants, all founders of contemporary Polish Jewish life. Konstanty Kostek Gebert, a co-founder of the Jewish Kindergarten in 1988 and the founder of the Midrash Magazine, a journalist and an author. Professor Stanisław Staszek Krajewski, co-founder of the Jewish Kindergarten and the Polish Council of Christians and Jews, a professor of philosophy and author and mountain climber. Monika Krajewska, who published full volumes of her extraordinary photographs of gravestones, which brought them to light for the first time in decades, an educator and a paper cutter extraordinaire. Chief Rabbi of Poland, Michael Shudrick, who in 1973 first investigated and sub subsequently invested more than 30 years and continues to invest in strengthening Jewish life in Poland. Full disclosure, these are my teachers, these are my guides, these are my friends. Mm -hmm. I was privileged to join them on the front lines 30 years ago. And we are now leading our positions as the founding parents to a new generation of Polish Jews, our children and theirs, who grew up, thanks to all of those that you'll meet tonight, able to explore and express their own Jewish identities with curiosity and pride. I am honored to be among them. Michael. The Elise, thank you. Thank you, Elise. Welcome everybody. Shana Tova, Gamar Khatima Tova. My name is Michael Trayson. I'm a lawyer in a law firm called Cullen and Eichmann in New York. Uh, my heart's in Poland at the moment, and my body's here in Chicago. And I'm looking at the same pictures you are and thinking how 30 years ago, I, I could not have imagined that all of these wonderful people that I would meet and get mm -hmm. to be friends with over the years that I'd be interviewing them today on this program. I'm so glad all of you are, are able to be here with us today, and I want to thank the Talby Foundation in particular. If I may, I'd like to take the uh, beginning of this presentation by laying a little bit of groundwork, not for everyone, because many of you know what I'm about to say. Maybe some others uh, will learn as we go through the program some context that they were not familiar with before. Let me try to summarize that. Uh, by uh, saying that, as you know, before the Versailles Treaty, before World War I ended, uh, what we simply call Poland in such broad terms was really three different empires that divided up the, the, the land that we now refer to as Poland, and that Poland became an independent country 
uh, between the time of the Versailles Treaty and, of course, the conquering and the invasion, the conquering that took place in 1939 and, and, and after that. Numbers, people are always asking how many, we never really know the numbers exactly, but the commonly accepted number is that in September or August 31st, 1939, there were about three and a half million Jews in Poland. Now, what's the context of that? Well, that constituted 10% of the country, which is huge in itself, but to be better understood, one should remember that something between 25 and 40 percent of urban Poland was Jewish. The top six cities were somewhere between 25 and 35 or more percent Jewish, which had a tremendous impact on the, on the country. And there were distinctions within the country, too, because of the different empires that had preceded independent Republic of Poland. And Poland had gone through periods of political change as well. The uh, Pilsudski era ended, and that began in the mid-1930s with the Andetsia and some of the same politics that we saw not only next door in Germany, but even in places far afield like the United States. Poland's numbers, however, need to be understood in terms of world Jewish population as well. Sometimes it's speculated that 80% of the Jews of the world have their roots in what was once Poland, somewhere from the gates of Kiev uh, to the to, to Wrocław, let's say, or from the Baltic down to the Black Sea, lands that were once upon a time ruled by Poland. Our heart is there, and Poland is in our hearts as well. And I think that's the reason we give so much attention to Poland. After, after the war ended, of course, we know that 90% of Polish Jewry had been exterminated by the Germans. And we often think there was nobody left, but there were people left, obviously. Some people say there were as many as 300,000 Polish Jews left. 100,000 perhaps still in the country. Maybe another 100,000 had fled to the Soviet Union. And then we had maybe 100,000 elsewhere. As we reach the 1940s, the second half of the 1940s, we go through a period of the Bricha. I recommend to people reading uh, Shimon Redlich's book, uh, In Transit, about wood. Mm -hmm. Another thing that was happening in those days, in the 10 years after the war ended, was population shifting. As you know already, the borders were moved, and Polish people who had been living in parts of what became Ukraine and the western end of the Soviet Union were transferred over to what had been a uh, part of the Reich, but were now parts of far western Poland. So there was a lot of population shifting as well. In the 1950s, there was unrest. In the mid 1950s, 56, there was a huge emigration again for, of Jewish people from Poland. Uh, the same thing occurred later on in 1968, uh, as you'll be hearing about. But I think what we want to focus on in our conversation today is the fact that Poland had Jews and a Jewish community at all times. And we want to focus on the latter part of the 1940s and then into the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And what we have before us today are five of the pioneers, five of the founding fathers and mothers of the Polish Jewish community that we see today. These are folks who are invested. Three of them uh, are, are people who were born and lived their entire lives there. Two of them came from elsewhere, but I suspect their souls were born there as well. They're tied to the country. And there's never been anything written about their stories, or very much written in English anyway, about the stories of what was happening in the Jewish world in Poland during those early years. So let me turn, first of all, in this conversation to Stasik. Stasik, tell us as much as you can in a brief time, as we've talked about, uh, about those early days right after the war, into the 50s, into the 60s, 
maybe some of the people that were around in those days. Stasik? Yes. So uh, about maybe, as you said, 300,000 Polish Jews passed through Poland. Most of them survived in the Soviet Union. And most of those who happened to be in Poland, to, to come to Poland, emigrated. And the Bricha was just 1946. Then there was the emigration wave after the establishment of the State of Israel. And then there was, it was not possible to emigrate, but after 1956, with the liberalization, it was again possible to emigrate. So this was the next wave of emigration. So most did emigrate, but some, quite a few, did not. Now, why ones did and the others didn't is uh, always, is a, there is no general way to tell because basically everybody had reasons to stay and reasons to leave. And for some, you know, those reasons to stay were stronger. For example, because they wanted, they had so opportunities for careers or they had uh, spouses, non-Jewish spouses, or they assimilated so much, perhaps hiding during the war, they, they did not want to go back to Jewish uh, life and to become Jewishly involved. Or some of them did believe that the communist Poland that was being created at that time would offer equal opportunities and possibilities of, for a better life, better than the life that had been before and ended or culminated with World War II and the Shoah. So the emigration, yes, but those others did not. And so finally in the 1960s, those Polish Jews who lived in Poland were mostly, almost exclusively, those who wanted to live in Poland, to be in Poland. They were often intermarried, and uh, and their children were usually raised with no Jewish, of course, there were all sorts of situations, but very often with no Jewish knowledge, involvement, understanding, to, to, to that, such an extent that, for example, people who were later important in tra translators or teachers of Yiddish or Hebrew uh, did not teach their children those languages. This was quite typical. So people, our generation, mean, meaning people born after the war and raised after the war, were usually very, very ignorant about the Jewish Judaism, Jewish languages, the Jewish culture, and all those things. Some of them were part of, were participating in the Jewish life some, in some sense, but the Jewish knowledge was very often minimal. In the 1950s, the communist-led uh, Jewish association was really preventing, the, for example, the, the learning of Hebrew or anything that could be connected to Zionism or the State of Israel. They wanted to promote the communist culture in the Yiddish language, but even that was not, that was not easy because uh, the younger generation, the youth, was not really very, you know, happy to, to go that way. Anyway, in the 1960s, those people who stayed in Poland thought they, they would, and were Jewish, they thought they would stay in Poland indefinitely, but, and they were usually very Polish culturally, but then the 1968 anti-Semitic campaign, government-sponsored anti-Semitic campaign occurred. And this was the major event that really shaped our lives and all the lives of our generation. Stasik, before we go there, can you tell us who were some of the leaders of the Polish Jewish community in the 50s, 60s and 70s? There were still some rabbis, but as I say, as I said, the Jewish religious community was marginalized, and the leaders were mostly Jewish communists, 
and who were uh, tr uh, you know trying to to promote the communist ideology and th this was not very different from any other social group in Poland the only exception to some extent was the catholic church which was too huge to, and powerful to to be completely marginalized <clears throat> but in all other groups it was similar so communists I were the leaders I, th I think when I first got there, the, la the last Shochet had just died, or maybe he was still alive. Was there kosher uh, shechita during the 70s, the 60s? Yes, there was. it was there, but it was very marginal. Very few people really cared about that. Very few people used that, but it was available. And I also remember that, yeah. Uh, you know, them, but it was a marginal phenomenon. It was not something that really was part of the, uh, you know, social good. life of the people we knew or we we had contact with. Well, when it comes to 1968, which you were taking us up to, I think of Kostik Gebert immediately. And Kostik, I wondered if you would talk a bit about that era. You can go be before 68 as well, if you would like. Uh, but tell us something about your experiences and your recollections. Well, the most important thing about the anti-Semitic campaign of 68 was that this was something that was never supposed to happen. One of the reasons why so many Jews endorsed the communist regime, clearly a higher percentage than in the overall population, was the belief that communism will put an end to anti-Semitism. And we have to remember that even after the war, Jews were being killed in Poland for being Jews, not only in the Kielce pogrom that everybody knows of, but more or less routinely, more or less all over, a recent historical study puts the number of Jews murdered in the first two years of post-war Poland at 1,200, and that is probably um, an underestimation. So communism was supposed to put an end to anti-Semitism, and for that reason, many Jews were willing to put up with everything else that communism wrote, since it at least guaranteed physical security, and also a sense of um, well, having the right to exist, being treated like everybody else. And then two things happen that destroy the solution. First, in 67, the wrong side won the Six-Day War. Poland, like the rest of the communist countries, supported the Arabs against Israel. And Israel's victory was seen in Poland, not only by Jews, but by the men on the street, as a victory over the Soviet Union, and therefore endorsed and cheered. The Warsaw joke at that time was, our Jews beat their Arabs, hooray for our side. The communist government did not appreciate. And already then, a purge of the remaining Jews in the military, in the police, and in political institutions started. And then, in March 68, Poland had its own student movement for democracy like the U.S. had in Berkeley or France later in May in Paris. Um, those movements, incidentally, were surprisingly similar in many aspects, one of them being a high participation of Jewish student activists, who, apart from the, of the fact of being Jewish, um, didn't really think of themselves as Jewish, but it became such a useful instrument to use against the movement. And in Poland, the Communist Party immediately seized that aspect and accused the students of being led and manipulated by a satanic conspiracy of Zionists and German revisionists who are trying to destroy the country. Um, that was the first time when Jews were painted with a neo-Nazi brush and it became a favorite, favorite element of government propaganda. But what initially started as a campaign against the students 
quickly became a campaign against Jews as such, officially called an an anti-Zionist campaign. But I got expelled from high school for being of quote-unquote Zionist extraction. This was the official reason, which shocked my communist parents no end, as you can imagine. (laughs) Um, It really would have been funny, except it wasn't. 68 was barely 25 years after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Okay, me and 68, for me, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was ancient history. Today, I know 25 years are next to nothing. And I still remember the conversations in my parents' living room about whether we stay, whether we leave, and the argument being, are we going to be idiots like we were in the late 30s? Don't we see it coming again? Okay, it didn't come again. Nobody got killed. For an anti-Semitic campaign, that was surprisingly unviolent. Um, a number of people committed suicide, but nobody was killed. There was almost no physical violence, but some 13 to 17,000 people were forced out of the country in public campaigns of condemnation of anything Jewish. And this went on for, no, for months. You couldn't open a newspaper, you couldn't open a radio without hearing anti-Semitic propaganda of the vilest kind. And those of us who stayed, most of us have the feeling that um, we are the last Jews in the country. I might have, when I entered university, suspected that some of my colleagues are Jewish, but I wouldn't, it wouldn't ever occur to me to ask them the way that today you wouldn't ask somebody, oh, do you have AIDS by any chance? Being Jewish. Caustic. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I w- at the time you're talking about, were there any prominent rabbis who were considered leadership for the Jewish community outside of the secular, I mean? No, not really. Um, Most everybody who wanted to live a Jewish life had left. The Mm -hmm. few observant Jews remained hidden in the background. I mean, a a few Stiebelach were operating. People would still daven. There was still a kosher slaughterhouse in Warsaw. And the state Yiddish theater continued to perform in Yiddish to an audience that listened to the Polish translation of the headphones. Um, but there was absolutely nothing Jewish on the surface. Um, the one thing that remained were books. The Jews who were forced to leave Poland couldn't take all their books with them. And then secondhand bookstores, you could assemble a serious collection of Judaica uh, for pennies, including, which was crucial, very good translations of classical Yiddish literature into Polish with footnotes, with blessed footnotes. Um, since I got expelled from high school for being a Zionist extraction and beaten up on the street for being a bloody kite, well, it developed a developed interest in trying to understand. So what is this Jewish thing I'm supposed to be and um, I turn to books. Okay. May I add something? Shoot. Yeah, please do. Uh, please do. It's in, you know, so 1968 is the, the last wave of emigration. And in most Jewish or even slightly Jewish families, there uh, are the discussion of whether to leave or to stay or to go was there also in my family to stay or to go. But and so, but but we, we we didn't we didn't leave it probably be if my father had lost his job at the university probably we would have gone emigrated but because he didn't although he had some various uh, obstacles in his uh, professional life uh, so we did it and then a year or two years later the matter did not be, did not uh, well, uh, wasn't really very um, uh, important. 
But the most important thing I think to remember about all those waves of emigration is that those who emigrated usually, you know, were telling wherever they went to Israel or America or whatever, that, you know, we have gone and everybody did and nothing Jewish is left. And yeah. this was repeated in 1946, 1950, and 1956, and in 1968 for sure. But it was never completely true. I remember I an article in the New York Times. A, a lecture I gave in Paris at the Bibliothèque Madame um, about post-war Jewish life. And once I finished, this elderly gentleman stands up and says, well, sir, that was all very entertaining. But frankly, it's nonsense. Jewish life in Poland ended in 1947. And I asked him, yeah. so when did you leave? Well, in 1947. <laughs> and yeah. this was obviously um, a very powerful feeling because the immigration was unspeakably painful. And before, yeah? I'm sorry, before we get too far away from the 1970s, uh, I wanted to turn to uh, to Monica. Uh, actually, I knew Monica more than 30 years ago through her books before I first stepped foot uh, off the airplane in Warsaw. But Monica, talk to us a little bit about the search for the, the tombstones, the cemeteries, the work that you were doing back then. Um. Well, I'm afraid this would be less historical and more personal because uh, I didn't do it as, as part of any movement or organization. Uh, we did it, well, uh, uh, except uh, uh, for the Stasek's <laughs> cooperation in it <laughs> all the time. And I had the feeling that um, we started, we were beginning from scratch. And it was uh, even impossible to, iman uh, to imagine how to look for anything Jewish. So uh, Kostek, you mentioned books. Okay, but, but the books that were left by people who emigrated were not uh, public uh, knowledge. You know, they, they were left to some families, friends, I don't know, maybe libraries, but it, the, there was really nowhere to look for um for any information traces, uh, to, I started. Uh, we started going to all uh, available uh, addresses. For example, the Jewish Historical Institute, where uh, which functioned uh, very differently than it does now. Uh, now. Uh, less than a scholarly institution, uh, but well, in a more let's say chaotic way, but still there were some uh, Jews who were, um, well, had the continuation of their Jewish life from, well, they were elderly at that time, and, and uh, I remember some of them, or I thought they were elderly, but probably they were our age and or much younger. And uh, from them, uh, one could get some information, but only some because they didn't have, um, uh, they didn't have the, such a broad uh, picture of Jewish life, but only more or less what they remembered or knew. Uh, so it was not uh, really uh, scholarly knowledge. Then uh, I was in touch uh, with the Jewish theater and that was uh, also an opportunity to talk with people like with Golda Tenzer, who um, is an example of somebody who uh, had the continu family continuation of, of uh, Jewish uh, life and involvement and uh, uh, speaking in Yiddish from home. Uh, so that was important as well. And then, um, well, when we started uh, to look for cemeteries, uh, we knew only about two uh, from our friend, uh, an ethnographer who uh, was uh, writing also a pioneering paper on uh, how Polish people in small towns remember uh, the tzaddiks. Uh, and from these two cemeteries, 
uh, we kept uh, searching uh, more or less uh, like it was a blind search. <laughs> we asked uh, some of the people in, in those towns, do you know about any Jewish cemeteries in the area? Uh, and sometimes they gave us right addresses. Sometimes they confused this, uh, confused it with some something else. But it was uh, very exciting field work, something that cannot be repeated now because now there are uh, Jewish uh, tours, you know, Jewish Poland in three days or Hasidic Poland in a day and a half or something like this. So that was. Um, completely uh, the other end of the <laughs> of the spectrum and we uh, hitchhiked we it was a bit difficult to get uh, uh, film for the camera uh, to say nothing about cameras and wherever we went we uh, tried to look for people or sometimes they surfaced by themselves uh, local people non-jewish who were interested in uh, they, they wanted to know anything Jewish, and what we knew then was almost nothing, but they knew less. So these were really memorable contacts. And also we asked uh, if there are any surviving Jews in those places. So we, uh, Kostek, you mentioned those sm small uh, stables in many towns, so we were in some of them and, and recorded what was possible. This, this could be a program and, just on its own. Yes, Stasha. That's right. One, one, one more addition. You know, we were visiting for the cemeteries partly also because of communism, so to say, because I was not granted the exit visa, so we couldn't go to to, to other countries, so we had to spend our vacations in Poland, and uh, Monica had that idea and passion for search to search the, for the cemeteries. Now let me add something too. So there, there were you know. So then we met some of the Jewishly involved individuals. Some of them had been, for example, colonels in the army, and and only later, after 1968, they came back to Jewish life, which was to them something natural because they, as children they went to to you know had had their or yeshiva education and some of them were, were were relatively well educated in this sense but you know to them to pass on that knowledge to us was not really possible they knew how it was in the heider it was in yiddish and hebrew and you know in the traditional way so how to say those things how to pass that knowledge that familiarity to young people you know who are university educated but had no jewish or hebrew language or anything like that from home so this was not something they really imagined was possible and probably it was not possible so there was a complete discontinuity this is the main thing they had children who were most often not in poland those individuals we met in the synagogues and other places because they, they children had emigrated in 1968 or 69. And people like us, first just a few of us, most taken ourselves and a few other friends, uh, but also then some others, very few of us were, you know, like culturally so different that we didn't really, we were, were not able to learn from them. We had to learn from other sources and those other sources were mostly American books. And just a small that um, the difference uh, of um, well um, world view that Stashek uh, difference of identity that Stashek just mentioned was partly because uh, we were all involved uh, Kostek and Stashek more and myself uh, not so perhaps. Uh, um, so strongly, but uh, still in uh, oppositional, in democratic opposition in Poland. And most of the other, of the, so to say, uh, old Jew, elderly Jews who we met didn't care about it at all. Well, well yeah. that's a great segue. I, I, I was just going to go to Kostik. Kostik, take two or three minutes and talk to us about the Flying University. The 
old gentleman who Stasek mentioned had very good reasons not to care about the democratic opposition. We were trying to dismantle the system they had helped build. Um, and they warned us, you know, don't, don't get involved in Polish politics. Um, it will all end badly for Jews. And we would laugh at just how stupid people can be, right? Okay, having said that, some of those colonels had been colonels in the secret police. It doesn't exactly make them um, cred morally credible interlocutors. But the fact is, that much of the revival of Jewish life happened not only outside any official structures, but in direct and conscious opposition to the other official structures as part of a broader Polish democratic movement. Mm -hmm. And this, this was such a natural, obvious thing for us that when Stasek, Monica, myself, a few others set up what later we called the Jewish Flying University, which was an informal study group where people would meet to discuss things of Jewish interest. And Monica, you are absolutely right. Any of us who lectured there knew next to nothing, but we were lecturing to people who knew nothing. Anybody who knew anything Jewish at all was pontificate um, to the utter admiration of everybody else. And you also said earlier, that um, you had to start from scratch. I think we started from itch more than scratch. The Jewish itch that made us, it impossible just to accept the fact that we don't know who we are and where we come from. But the point is, the Jewish Flying University, um, had we then even thought of it in those terms, had as many Jewish as non-Jewish participants. And your personal identity in ethnic or religious terms was completely immaterial for participating in the movement. The movement was part of a wider movement for a better Poland. And it was obvious that people will be part of it. And it was obvious that rebuilding Jewish knowledge and Jewish identity is contributing to a future democratic Poland since the communist Poland we live under doesn't want any Jewish knowledge or Jewish identity. Kostik, thank Kostik. you. Michael Shudrich, if I remember correctly, you first stepped foot in Poland just at the end of the 1970s, is that correct? Uh, first time is 1973. Ah, beginning. So tell us about those days. What brought you there? Pan Am. That's how long ago I came. Uh, what, I, I came in the first time when I was 18 years old with uh, one of the very first Jewish groups uh, for teenagers that, that came through Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe, Soviet Union, onto Israel, and became fascinated, certainly about the part about Israel, but also very much what was left outside of the Soviet Union and what we in the States would call Soviet satellite countries. Uh, what was really left? because to travel by yourself in the Soviet Union was very difficult in the 70s. Uh, but it was actually fairly easy to do in Hungary, uh, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. So I started coming back. I came back in 76, 77, 79. And uh, in the summer of 79, that's when I first met Monica Stasik and Kostik. So we've known each other since we had, I had hair, and they had different color hair. <laughs> well, then... Go on with your story. It's fascinating that you were there in the 70s, you were bitten, and you stayed engaged. Yes, it's... Um, there, there are several different reasons, but I, I remember one, one thing particular that struck me. I was This was, I think, in 82 when I was in Moscow, not in Poland, but Moscow. Uh, and... Something struck me. I, I went to visit a refusenik and knocked on the door. And 82 was a particularly nasty time. Uh, and he opened the door in jeans, a T-shirt, colorful suspendo, suspenders, and like a big colorful Yemenite yarmulke. And I looked at him and I said, that could have been me. 
The only difference is that my grandparents made one choice to leave for the United States and his grandparents didn't. And the fact that I had the blessing of growing up in a democratic country, the fact that I had the tremendous, for me, the most wonderful advantage to going to Jewish schools, elementary school and high school and going to rabbinical school, although I wasn't rabbinical school yet. Well, in 79 it was. Uh, it had nothing to do. I got all those blessings, all those benefits through nothing that I did. It was through decisions that my grandparents and my parents made. And I had a sense of that that creates a certain kind of moral obligation to try to equal the level of the playing field, to be able then to give back to uh, others whose grandparents made different decisions. Was there, was there something about the magnetism that was related to your, your studies, what you had been studying in terms of religious studies that made Poland even more meaningful for you? No. Sorry. The, what, made what, people, happened? What, what made Poland meaningful to me were the people. Yeah. Later, I began to understand more that this was the place of uh, of the Remo and the and uh, and Yeshivat Chachmi Lublin and and many many others, but I really think at first what it was is meeting young Poles, discovering their Jewish roots when we were we were still the same age, but then we were young. And the fact and, and that, what I'm hmm? sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. What developed for you that you were able to return as a professional and to be there full time? How did that develop? Well, I had, after I finished rabbinical school, I finished uh, a master's. At, I, I went off to be rabbi in Tokyo for six years, 83 to 89. Moved back to New York in the fall of 89 and started looking for a job, which I thought would be a kind of a good idea. Good uh, idea, yeah. Highly recommended. And uh, it just, we say in English serendipitously, but it's a much easier word in Yiddish, Bashert, that it was just at the time, just a couple, like it was, well, I came back to this, it's two months after democratic elections in Poland. A couple months later, the Berlin Wall fell. And I said, well, you know, maybe I should do, start working somewhere in, in Eastern Europe, because now we're in Central Europe, but you know, we, we moved. Uh, which is also a fascinating story, but maybe it was time that I could try to do something there. And um, by March of uh, 1990, I had met with uh, Rabbi Haskell Besser of Blessed Memory, who then was um, the rabbinic figure at the Ronald Slaughter Foundation, which the whole foundation was only about a year old. And soon after met uh, Ronald Slaughter, who told me at our first meeting, where have you been? I've been looking for you. Uh, and I was started working here in March of 90. Chushan Purim 1990. So it's been a few weeks already. Can you recall those days for us a little bit? Chushan Purim? No, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really a bad person to be interviewed. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, when, you know, if I had been here in 1990 and came back in 2000, I'd probably have a much easier time remembering what it was like in 1990. But because it's been a, you know, pretty much a, a, a constant flow of time, um, I have a much more difficult time remembering. I, I do have some memories of that in the early 90s, I had to do everything myself. That means like, you know, buy the Coke and, 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 and water and put up the chairs. But what I do remember is the tremendous excitement that I got from the from people coming forward and saying, you know, wow, there's some place I can go to see something Jewish. I just discovered that my grandfather, my grandmother, my son it was Jewish. Uh, and I remember probably one of the very first Hasidic groups that came here, I'm guessing around 93. Uh, uh, there were groups before, but this is one that I remember. Uh, and the Rebbe came with about 40, 50 Hasidim. And they made a, uh, 
the Shabbos dinner, and then the Rebbe Tish, the Rebbe's Tish, in in our building next to the synagogue, what we call the White Building, and uh, and you know, for our guys to see like a real Rebbe's Tish was like unbelievable. Sitting in Warsaw, it was uh, coming back to real roots, and yet something completely unknown. And I uh, remember standing there after the meal, I don't know what time it was already, 11 o'clock at night, and having explained to the people what's going on, people re reconnecting, rediscovering, wanting to be Jewish. And one of the Hasidim turned to me and said, tell me, how can you live here? At which point the person standing next to him was the Rebbe's son, and the Rebbe's son answered for me. He said to the, other, to the Hasid, how can you not be here? Uh, and for me, that's, you know, where else as a rabbi would I have the opportunity to make such a difference, to be able to teach people who are just now discovering not Judaism, also Judaism, but discovering that they have Jewish identity and, and what a tremendous, uh, you know, privilege it is to be part of that journey. So let me just remind you something. Um, early 90s, Jewish summer camp in the Yeah. Um, uh, and you had just arrived from the, from the States, totally jet-lagged, and there was a Q&A with you, um, with all the young people pestering you with questions about everything and anything conceivably or inconceivably Jewish. And around 3 a.m., completely blurry-eyed, you started climbing out of the chair and saying, well, guys, look, tomorrow is another day. Give me a break. <laughs> At which one of the girls pushed you back into the chair and said, you don't understand. We are the next generation of Jewish mothers in this country. We need to know everything right now. <laughs> Something I because, because yes, I mean, I haven't slept because, since. Yes, um, because uh, in connection with Rehvaut, because this is something that brings us uh, not only to, to tell people what Rehvaut was. Oh, perhaps, perhaps in a minute, because I just will make a very short. Uh, a short introduction. Well, they, they were the uh, uh, camps that lasted for ten years. They were uh, developed from from one camp during the summer, summer camp. Then there were also the uh, camps for families, for um, teenagers, and for um, Holocaust survivors. Um, and uh, this is something that connects, and, and uh, Rabbi Shudrick was, uh, well, the soul of those camps. And uh, this connects us with uh, the next generation, because this is something that uh, our children grow up with. And uh, it's really, well, it's also for a long story, so I won't, uh, I won't continue. Uh, but uh, everybody has, uh, you know, wet eyes rem remembering those camps because, well, this is something that. Everybody, very... our generation, yeah. not yeah. necessarily yeah. our children. No. For our children, everything is taken for granted. Yeah. And they think, you know, that there are more interesting it's, things yeah. in life than being uh, doing Jewish things. But to us, it was a revelation. Yeah. And I would like to add. Um, yeah. uh, one more thing uh, before I forget and before it's all over, uh, that uh, that was also something in which our uh, sons participated and one uh, does uh, till this uh, very year, that is um, uh, the uh, Jewish, uh, F Jewish Culture Festival in Krakow. Because although it was created by uh, Janusz Makuch and Krzysztof Gerak um, by non-Jews and basically for people like them who um, wanted to know more about um, 
uh, about Jews because they felt the the Jewish absence very strongly in Kazimierz, uh, the Jewish formerly the Jewish part of Krakow, and this developed into an, an event that brought together. Uh, Jews, non-Jews, uh, foreign Jews, Polish Jews, and uh, it's uh, until now those festivals continue, and they've been a very significant part of our lives. We didn't miss one, I think, and also for uh, our teenage sons. And also for many others, because in fact, you know, this made, this festival made Jewishness respectable, I would say. So those people who oh, are aware of Jewish origin, they mm -hmm. who really were afraid of becoming more Jewish involved, when they saw that even the Goim were interested in Jewishness, they thought, well, okay, maybe I can also try. So in yeah. this sense, it was very major uh, the assistance to us. Well, one of the, well, excuse me, cost the fact that what you had mentioned as a run of the mill for our kids was in fact a fundamental turning point. Um, I have four children, three of them went through the general Polish school system because there was no Jewish school. My youngest, Shimon, went to the latter school that Khalid used to run some time ago. And his experience of being Jewish is totally different from his elder siblings, or from mine, or from yours. We all grew up knowing that to be Jewish is to be alone. He grew up knowing that to be Jewish is to be part of a gang. He had to find out that there are kids who are not Jewish. And this changes your perspective on life, on life fundamentally. Which is why I think the this, this school is and remains the most important Jewish institution because it produces Jewish kids who don't know that to be Jewish is to be alone. So it's time for, I think, you know, for Halise to say something about the yeah, school. Yeah, I was about to say, let's, I, I want to turn to Halise because Halise has played a role, a leading role in so many different functions. We're talking about the school, but that's only one of those. Halise, tell us about when you first came to Poland and what brought you and what your experiences were. And then if you could kind of summarize some of the different roles you played. And I'll point out to everyone that we are four or five minutes till the end of the presentation before the Q&A. Go ahead, Halise. So, thank you. I'm mesmerized by my friends and colleagues and the reminiscences and the reflections. And I realized that when I, uh, I mean, I, I, I remember distinctly um, watching Solidarity in 1981, 80s, 81, on the television from our nice TV in New York. And um, watching it with great anticipation. And, and I remember my former husband was, a, Jew, a scholar of, of Hebrew of Jewish, studies, Jewish studies, but Eastern Jewish, Eastern European Jewry, and he was fascinated. And I was on the ride, uh, but it was still far away. It was far away. And you have some roots that are now in their Piazka Piawa, but when my grandparents left, it was Austria Hungary. So I came to Pol I came to Poland actually. Who brought me here is really Rabbi Michael Shudrick. Um, he invited me, and this is actually my 30th anniversary, Michael, we should celebrate. I was a Hillel director mm -hmm. at Columbia University, Columbia Barnard, and he calls me and he says, look, Halise, you know how to run Shabbat dinners for groups. Um, I need you to do this. I can't be there. There's a conference for hidden children, um, those who were hidden during the war. And we have a Polish group. The first time I believe a Polish group was able to participate in, in a world conference please, you know, host the dinner. And honestly, I had no idea who I was opening the door to. I really, I mean, children, I, I, I really wasn't aware. Um, I'm now a little embarrassed by my perhaps un being uninformed naive, but I think I have to say the naivete was, was a plus. And I think my friends will agree 
that this idea it will be, we will build it. Um, walked into the room and I was captivated. Even though my Polish was really non-existent, there was an eagerness, a warmth. A, a men, a, you know, you could see that the Pintala Yid, um, Kostek talked about this in a in different form. It, it was alive and well 60 years later with no nurturing. And then the thought of what could happen if we nurtured that Pintal, that little piece of Jewish life spirit. So we, I, uh, Rabbi Shudrick said, thank you. How can I thank you? I said, well, let us come to Richvau, to the summer camp that's just been discussed. And it was a magical opening of people who, and I have to say, I think growing up in a small town with a very small Jewish community, I, I, I profess a kind of sense of kinship. I was the only Jewish kid in my class in high school. Um, I was different. I felt part of something that was general, but my Jewish life was my home. Um, and so there was this kind of, I don't know, we met at a, we met on a bridge, several bridges. Um, and I remember, I'm not sure how guys, cause I have pictures of this, but how did I run the children's program? What language do we speak? Kostek, you couldn't have played at all of that. Um, I came <laughs> across our first play, which I think we should do for Purim this year. Um, and so um, Michael, when you ask, this was the beginning for me. Um, and when I was invited by Ronald Lutter to help start a school, please understand that the seeds of that school were, were planted already by the people on this call um, who took the courageous step of starting a kindergarten for their own children, never having had one in their own apartment. Um, and I was honored to be given this task I, as I say, I think now back 30 years and, and I agree with Kostek that one of the most important institutions that we need to support and nurture is our school. Um, I think a little bit, you know, people ask you questions. Well, what do you see in five years? That's a little hard. Um, I know what I envisioned, but I never imagined that we would be having this robust conversation. And while we're doing it, we have, let's see, Hillel in Krakow and Hillel in Warsaw. I just met with the new Moisha House representative and there will be a Moisha House again in Warsaw. <laughs> there are, you know, there are different kilo, different congregations and some of us talk to each other. Most of us talk to each other. I mean, all those things. I mean, who would have imagined that there would be a JCC in Warsaw or in Krakow? I mean, there are universities that are teaching Jewish studies and Yiddish and Hebrew. And I'm glad that Monica brought up the uh, Jewish Culture Festival because part of all of us is this work or this life that we lead, because some of it's work and it's, most of it's life, is really something we do with Jews and non-Jews. We make, it's, it's a kind of a set. One does not function without the other. And without the safe Jewish space and without the Jewish knowledge, um, that this tree that all of these people planted seeds so many years ago wouldn't be flourishing. Um, Elise, before, uh, if I can interrupt you, before we get to the questions and answers, there are several observations I'd like to, uh, to make. One of them is that as you speak, it's more and more clear that we really need to have another one of these sessions and maybe another 10 of these sessions. The second thing I'd like to do is go back to something Michael said about the person saying, how could you not be here? It's difficult for me, impossible for me to imagine the Polish Jewish community today without the five of you having existed and taken on what you've done. And the third observation is that one theme that runs through everything all of you have said is a tremendous connection that each one of you feels, not just a commitment, but a connection. Several of you have talked about identifying uh, with the people and, and, and seeing no other path in life except the one that you've occupied so pr prominently. You are the founding fathers and mothers. I am in awe of all you have done. I think life is a lot easier these days than back when you guys were doing your original work. And I think the whole world owes, the whole Jewish world and the whole world owes you all a very, very strong thank you 
And Halise, I think you've been monitoring some of the questions and answers. Can we, are there some questions there to talk about? Well, actually, I would say, I mean, trying to keep track, most of them are really wonderful wishes from many of the friends, um, people who've lived here before, Rabbi Joseph Konofsky, um, people who oh, have found the school, Jacqueline. Um, mostly they are people who are delighted, actually, by this conversation, who are enthralled. And, and I would say, Michael, if I may, as prerogative of, as a host, um, and the director of the Toby Center, that um, we represent a lot of people. Okay, it may be me sitting here, but it was, it was, and continues to be a lot of teachers, and in, in terms of the school and the work I'm doing now, teachers and educators and tour guides, and in behind Kostek are you know the successors to Midrash and and all of these other things and Rabbi. Shudrik, all the people that he's teaching, and, and Monica and Stashik, we are we are we are representatives um, of other people who continue to be who they are, which is Polish Jews. And the fact that there's you know new generations, little little people, who are now you know of course they're going to the Jewish kindergarten. Where else would you go? Um, or yes, I go to, you know, I'm going to Hillel because I want a place for a Seder. Um, these are, these are the kind of comments. These are the kind of reflections that you could say you could have anywhere in the world. And if I may, guys, I think part of us may indeed be special, but I think being just part of the Jewish world and being normal is a real accomplishment. Um, I know, okay, Kostek, I'm looking at your face. Normal? At least you're using the word normal and you're talking about us? Don't me, Um Let so me open I'm just up looking... to all of you a question. Uh, if, if you were to speak out to the Jewish world around the globe outside of Poland, is there anything that you would say to the Jewish world about what you'd like to see them do, how to be engaged or how they can help support the continued growth of the community. Michael, any comments on that? Well, um, I'll, I'll try to make this as fast as possible. Uh, what's happening here is highly unusual in Jewish history. This community was devastated, destroyed, left for dead by the by most people in this country and by the jewish world and then through the great miracle of democracy democratic elections in 1989 we discovered that there are some jews left and while we cannot change the number of jews killed during the shoah the holocaust we can change the number of jews lost to the jewish people and we're bringing those lost jews back to the Jewish people, those who want it. And if you want to talk about Jewish continuity, then the place to help do it is also very much here. Because no matter how you live your Jewish life anywhere in the world, that Jewish life was, if not created, it flourished here in Poland. If you're a Hasid, a Zionist, a secularist, a Bundist, if you're into Jewish journalism, film, uh, literature, it flourished here like nowhere else. And we are the cultural inheritors of every different kind of Jewish life thanks to what was created in Poland. And now we have the historical opportunity to give back to the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren of those people who created the Judaism as we live it. Just a quick, a quick, quick example. Um, Zamenhof, the creator of Esperanto, which was supposed to become the international language, never quite took off, but still a tremendous effort, had a sister. The sister's great, great grandson is now studying in yeshiva in Israel. That's continuity. Fantastic. By the way, he also had a, a brother who was my uh, 
the husband of my, of one of my ancestors. But anyway, anyway, let me let me add something. If there was a question Please. here I saw on the comments side the, about the Jewish telephone hotline. Yes, we yeah. did establish it in the uh, early 90s, uh, in the mid 90s actually, for those people who wanted to, you know, to do ask about the Jewishness and about the roots or about whatever, and didn't have uh, anywhere to, to, to turn to. And uh, and this was operating for a few years. And was advertised but it, it was advertised in the newspaper. It was like the hotline. It was, of course, a bit problematic to some people because you know there was there was this list of telephone hotlines, you know, for battered wives and for alcoholics and then for those with Jewish roots. But anyway, <laughs> uh, it did work. It did work, and uh, the, although you know. Uh, but it was important in the era, era when you know there was no internet, no possibility of learning and getting in touch, which is now so easy through all those channels that we know about. So it was it discontinued to you after several years. And let me add one more reflection about all those things, namely the question about what the world can do is a bit problematic for me. I mean, I mean, it's it's a fine as a question, as a, as a problem, but I am a bit ashamed that we are, we the Polish Jews, Polish, Polish Jews, as I say, that is Polish Jews who have lived in Poland all their lives, basically, that we are not uh, independent enough to really be able to create our Jewish lives by ourselves. And everything that has happened in Poland uh, in the past, basically 30 years or more than 30 years, has been done with the assistance and very important uh, uh, participation of, uh, of friends who came from America and later also from Israel, and of the foundations like Loder and the Toby Foundation, uh, with, that were assisting financially in many other ways, and all those individuals who were uh, in active, and even the most specifically Polish establishment, that is the Association of the Children of the Ho of the Children of the Holocaust, that is e individuals who used to be Jewish children during World War II in Poland and survived and have stayed in Poland and many of them are Catholic, by the way. So this very specifically Polish association was also established because of a gathering in New York with the help of Michael Sh Rabbi Shudrich. And so all those things were done due to uh, uh, an assistance of American and other Jewish friends. This is something that I think should be you know, not continued, that now really there are enough Polish Jews, although they are very, a very small group, to, and enough you know, resources of our own to do things uh, even without such assistance, I hope. Um, thank you, Scott. Except, Michael? okay, now, uh, uh, Michael, may I? Uh, yeah, when, when we started 30 years ago, it's it's, you know, would you would you be embarrassed if an infant needed help eating? Would you feel embarrassed if a two-year-old needed help walking? Would you feel embarrassed that you still had to guide a teenager? So uh, I, I think that many things were very much supported by help from the outside. No, but number one, we are one Jewish people. So the fact that American Jews or Israeli Jews are helping us is, is not... It's coming from the outside. It's coming from within because we're one Jewish people. And just as the American Jews that are giving to us have benefited from what Polish Jewry created for a thousand years, I, I see it, it, it's just, you know, sometimes one side is helping more the other side. But it's a, it's a synergy, it's an energy that goes both ways. Number two, I, I yes, even if you take our JCC, it started by the joint. Fantastic. Thank you, JDC. But it's run completely by local people. Um, you know, even among the rabbis. Yes, we only have, at this point, 
we've had others. We've had a few young Polish Jews that have finished rabbinical school. Right now, we just have one that is a practicing rabbi in Poland. The rest do come from abroad. But we have Chazanim that are local. Our, our Jewish, uh, the, Jew, the leaders of the Jewish communities are local. Uh, the Midrash was created completely local. Chidush complete, funded. We got help, got funded from the outside. But the created, the creation, creating all was caustic. And now Chidush in Vratzlav, completely local. And I want to go, I want to bore everyone going through the list. Hillel, funded from the outside, completely run by local people. So it's, we're in a transition period. And there's no reason for us not to benefit from uh, not only financial, but intellectual, spiritual, or from outside. But yes, we should also take responsibility. Michael, thank you. I, I, I'm very sensitive to people's time, especially Erev uh, Kony Dre. People are thank getting you. ready. <laughs> and, and I know that all of you have really gone to do a great effort to be present for this today, including our audience. And to everyone, Gemar Khatimatova, thank you so much. Talis, thank you for organizing this. Yeah. It is our pleasure at the Toby Center. And I have a few closing comments. Um, first of all, again, Michael Trayson, this came out of a conversation, which we, I hope it's a continuous conversation. Um, thank you for moderating and inspiring it. Thank you, Kostik and Monica and Stasik and Michael for all you've done and continue to do and for really articulating beautifully how we got here. Um, where we're going is now slowly, as Michael say, transitioning to new hands. Um, we can be the elders um, and hopefully <laughs> give advice. Um, also um, participate with full hearts and full souls. Um, I would just say I would be remiss. Uh, one of our flagship programs are educational and heritage tours. So one thing you can do is if your roots are here, come visit the homeland. If you're interested in finding out about dimensions of Jewish life, heritage, history, and culture, come visit. And uh, we'd be happy to share a very engaging experience with you and maybe meet some of the people um, who've been involved and continue to uh, strengthen our Jewish community. So thank you all. May you go from strength to strength. Thank you, dear participants. As uh, Michael said, we're grateful to all of you who already support um, the TGH Talks series as it's solely supported by contributions and invite others to do so. If you want to make a contribution, we'll send you information. It will be in the email that will follow along with um, a link to the recording. So if you'd like to watch it again or share it with your friends and family, please do. I think one of the uh, key elements here is we want the story to be told. It should not be a secret. So, and I want to thank our TJHT Talks team, Kaya Shichek and Jakub Wyshak, who's making all this magic happen. For those of you who are observing or marking Yom Kippur, I hope we wish that it will be meaningful. And we look forward to seeing you in October on the 20th for an exciting look at Yiddish and where we are today. So may we all be inscribed and sealed for a healthy, happy, fruitful year. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Marhati Matova.